So, as you can see, I work for, well, I, I'm actually a student, so I know what I will be talking about when I say hack the MOOCs, because I work for the Open University in the UK. And this will be the main target group that I will talk about, 16 to 17 year olds. But first of all, I want to start with a general framing of the project itself. I think if you raise the uh, idea of MOOCs, there are people who are for it, there are people who are against it and everything else, and there are lively discussions and dropout rates are mentioned frequently. But to me, it's just free, it is available, and you can just download lots of stuff on MOOCs, so, which makes it really interesting. Now, when I was starting to contemplate a project in secondary school, well, actually, we didn't have any idea that we were going to start with a project uh, on MOOCs and in uh, K or secondary school until we had a couple of glasses of wine, some cheese, and we were sitting around the campfire with a couple of teachers and directors of schools. And as the evening grew late, we became more and more enthusiastic. We really were. That's the start of, of the project. And it was in June last year, so quite recently. It was really good wine. <laughs> now, first of all, we had a challenge. So we were talking, discussing around the table, and we were thinking, we need to put a little bit of fire into our students, because most of the time they just sit in the classroom and go, whatever you do. Now we have group work, oh. and then they turn a little bit. That's it. <laughs> so we wanted to create something which would spice them up, and so we think, or we thought, let's look at the secrets of passionate, really successful learning. We can do that. We are such type of people, all of us. We can do that. It's easy. Secrets. Ha! Huh. We all have them. Now, a second challenge would be, once we knew... What to, how to make passionate, successful learning happen, we would have to fit it into the school and curriculum policy. Quite a challenge. I'm from Belgium. This was a project with a Belgian uh, school. So I'm not sure. In Ireland, it's probably much easier to get new projects started in secondary school. I, I'm sure. <laughs> no, maybe some challenges, but... So we needed to know for sure what a MOOC really was, not just a definition. And then, if you want to go to the policymakers, once you have all this in place, and you want to say, look, we did this project, they will say, what are the outcomes? Can you prove them? It's the same everywhere, in every country. So we, will, we thought, look, if we can make a project that is research-based and really personalized, in a secondary school, we'll have this. Tip the scale towards beautiful success. So that's what we did. We started off, what are the secrets? The secrets are the flow. Most of the time, we put everybody of the same age into a classroom. There's some kind of diversification, uh, general sciences, maths, uh, uh, more... Uh, so, I'm not sure how it's called. It's like those classes where you learn how to sell things to people. How is it called? Marketing. Ah, marketing. Look, I'm not a marketing person. So we have these classes as well. So there is diversification. But nevertheless, we hardly get to this flow channel, which is described 20, more than 25 years ago by Chicks and Mihaly, and who says, look, if we can get people, any one of us, in this flow channel, we will learn more easily. And it doesn't, of course, this is not a fixed boundary. And sometimes you become bored because you have much more skills than your job asks, demands from you or your courses provide for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have far too many challenges and you get really nervous, either in your job or what you're learning. So there's like... A nice balance you, you need to seek 
to get into the channel. But that balance is very personal. There are people who learn like this, they skyrocket in, and there are people who need more time to learn something. And the topics that they find of interest can also vary. So that was a challenge we needed to keep in the back of our heads, well, a solution actually, if we could make learning a little bit more personalized for 16-year-olds, maybe we would get more people into, more students into that uh, flow channel. And then there's, of course, something else which we know works. Anybody who's learning something regulates their learning, if they want to learn, if they are actually interested in something. So, and they do this very, you can simplify what Pinterest said to you, that you do something, you think about it, you try it, and then you do it all again, but in a better or more improved way, or at least it will be changed and you can evaluate it again. Now, he did a lot of studies and other researchers came in and they said it's about personality traits. And they listed quite a variety of uh, characteristics, but at the end, they found two major characteristics that were really significant for the effect of successful learning. Self-esteem and intrinsic motivation, or well, motivation, let's say. So we thought, okay, we can do this. Now, the, so we knew what to try and get out into the project to make it successful and passionate. Now we needed to know what MOOCs was. I can give you this slide, but we all know what MOOCs are. Lots of people, it's online, it's free, all well. But what is it really? I mean, the definition is good to start a discussion about something, but there's like a hidden thing as well. With MOOCs, in general, the, uh, one of the last reports told, uh, told us 35,000 euros is the cost of an average MOOC. Now, 35,000 euros, that's two years of my pay. So, if you're a teacher, chances are that you will not be able to make a MOOC. Luckily, they are out there for free for us. If we use the material, because if you look at MOOCs, they are curated. And I don't know about you, but if I, in, I used to prepare my lessons by going online and think, going to libraries, and it took me ages. And sometimes you want to just put this small point across. And that point is sometimes inside one of those MOOCs, one of those topic-related MOOCs, in a, as a movie, six-minute movie. Just download the movie, use it in a class. MOOCs are actually knowledge that can be used like a kind of Robin Hood. It's made by the few, we can use it for the many. One of the examples uh, of what a difference online learning can make for the age group, in this case he was slightly younger, Jack Andraka. Anybody know Jack Andraka? The so what, he's a 15-year-old boy and one of his close relatives uh, dies of pancreatic can uh, cancer. He dies and the boy thinks this it was devastated. So he went online and he, th he said to himself, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to solve this pancreatic cancer uh, problem because the problem was once pancreatic uh, cancer is diagnosed, you only have the test, first of all, is only 30% accurate. It costs 800 euros. And it is made 60 years ago, 60 years ago. So he said, I can do better. 15-year-old, teenage optimism, flying out the door, completely passionate. He took into the flow. So challenges, skills, challenges, skills. And he always kept on going. And at the end of the road, after just one year, he got a new biomarker, based, paper-based, for the cost of three cents with an accuracy nearly to 100% and actually being able to uh, find pancreatic cancer symptoms really early on into the disease. He did this by using the internet. He did this by using online courses that he had access to. 
So just imagine if we can do, make that available, available to more of our uh, students. So let's use them. That's my idea. Be the Robin Hood. Let them become the Robin Hood even better. So we looked at what was done in schools, because for everybody there's a lot to learn about MOOCs in general. We, some of the teachers in the school used MOOCs or part of MOOCs in their curriculum. It's easy enough. You know your content, you know what you're lacking, and you can see quality if you, as a teacher. So you just downloaded it and, and used it. Of course, there is intellectual property. Depending on the platform, you can freely use it or you can just by uh, making an attribution, or you can have slightly more copyright problems. Try the ones who are make everything freely uh, available. Now, some teachers actually use the MOOCs to build a new lesson plan as well. One of the teachers in the school, so that was the year before, I came there and gave a workshop on MOOCs and how they could implement it in classes, and one of the teachers actually built a new course on robotics with all the courses that were around. So that's also an easy to use MOOC alternative. And then of course flipped classroom, but you're going to hear a great presentation about flipped classroom here, where you direct the students to online material and then do the classwork, uh, more of a discussion, Inside of the class, there are variations on it. But it makes it possible to get, let's say, a feel of online material and what it can mean to the students. So that's also a nice approach. And then there's one which I really like. Well, it's just one of an, uh, an example <coughs> of using MOOCs to strengthen young students to get into university or any type of pro professional school uh, as well. Now I'm just, all these slides are freely available on SlideShare. I will give you the, the URL later on, so you can, if you're interested, you can read the paper. I'm a researcher. I like reading papers, that's what I do. Apart from doing projects, which I like even better actually. So, I like the combination. So, we looked with the teachers and with the directors, we looked at all the options that were out there, and then we got our project together. It's called CLIL MOOC Project. <coughs> Why? It's a strategic choice. CLIL is Content and Language Integrated Learning. Now that is something Europe goes mad about. You get money, you get hours, teachers. That is something to do, but the only thing is, it's only given to non-English speaking countries. So I would say, speak more Irish, <laughs> you will get it. That's. And then the other uh, part of the course was of course, uh, massive open online courses. Now the school is really a big school in a part of Belgium called Kortrijk. And it's called the Husco School. It's, uh, well, it's a new name for a bigger school. It, they came together. And the project runs there for, throughout the academic year, this academic year. So it started in September and it runs till June. And it's given, the course is given two hours every week. So it's kind of an intensive course, being a new course. And there are three classes, all in what, we, uh, what is called free space, because that gives a little bit of leeway in terms of policy and curriculum uh, and options. There are two English groups who follow that course and one French group, because in that part of Belgium, the m m mother tongue is Dutch or Flemish. Now the target population, as I said, is 16 to 17 year olds, and they're mostly students who are aiming to go to university. We had a strong discussion about this. I think it's also possible for other types of uh, students and uh, classes. But to start off with, this was the easiest group. So it's a combination of uh, students, because students come from a variety of classes anyway, because it's an optional choice. They have different options to follow as well, like additional languages. Uh, but this one was created kind of a motivation. 
So 42 uh, learners, I think 42, yeah. Uh, we aim to, do, to have smaller classes, but we came to 42 uh, because there were so much uh, enthusiastic reactions on it. The MOOCs that we use are a combination of these. So you have the traditional uh, English ones, edX, FutureLearn, and Coursera. And for the French courses, we used FUN, and which is the more of a university kind of MOOC, and France Television, which is easier uh, topics to produce too. So then we had to come up with a lesson plan because it was a new course and it needed to create passionate learners and it needed to enable the students to create their own flow or find their own flow. So in order to do that, we thought any good plan has three steps. So whatever we do, we need to create three steps. You actually believe this? <laughs> <laughs> we just came up with three steps. It's, uh, so first of all, we started with a group MOOC. In this group MOOC, we progress uh, with the complete class and we look at the specific elements of a MOOC. Look, this is peer review, this is the media, uh, the syllabus is structured in this way. It's fairly similar to Moodle to be with these uh, edX and Coursera and FutureLearn courses. You have these differences between them and every step of the way is clearly um, discussed in class as well as the, the digital skills that you need to have and how to select the courses because how can you see that a specific MOOC is better than another one on the same subject? How are you going to decide which to follow? All these types of things that kind of touch uh, meta-learning as well. The next step would be the own MOOC. There the students uh, get together and choose a MOOC they want to follow. So because by then we thought, okay, if we, they go through a MOOC as a class, in the second stage, they will be able to choose one for, for their own sake, bringing them closer to passionate learning. That's what we assume. That's it. And then the last stage, we said, okay, we need to do, make the circle, uh, full, make full circle. So we want them to evaluate the full process of the year, teachers, students, the complete experience, and produce something that they can offer to students who want to follow the MOOC CLIL course next year. Why? Because we thought it would be a nice addition. to It's not only digital literacy, but then also really digi higher digital skills, let's say. Each of those phases takes up like three months. So we are now at the own MOOC stage. And for each stage we had the teachers come up with specific uh, lesson plans and steps that they will follow. The first, as I said, the group MOOC was followed uh, by the whole class. So they needed to find a MOOC which was interesting enough to as many students as possible. And the choice came, uh, was the rise of superheroes and their impact on pop culture. And it's really a great course because it has simulations, you get to draw things, you get to discuss, you get to see Stan Lee and interact with him if you want to. So it's like really great course if, uh, if you're even interested only in reading uh, magazines, it's good. And as they go through that MOOC course, the teachers told them, look, uh, we can't do, the com of course they couldn't do the complete MOOC, follow them for weeks. But what the teachers did, they asked them to register for the course, all the students for the course, and then they picked the cherry. So, this is a forum, now we are going to go by the whole class and discuss in that forum uh, about that topic or that topic. And each time those little interactions were prepared in class because we are not native English speakers, we just speak as we need to and so there was a challenge to get everybody to the same level where they are willing to speak in a different language. It can, can be tough, uh, especially for well, students that age. Now, 
I put this uh, slide in because in many MOOCs you also have peer reviews. And so uh, students start, uh, started to, uh, to say, look, how accurate can we be? They're 16, 17 year olds. On average, peer reviews by peers are more successful or better or uh, more valid than the teachers for a number of reasons. There's been nice research done on that, and so I just wanted to add this. But it made it possible to go through all the stages. That's what I wanted to say. Really look at the complete MOOC interaction or array, because they would need to interact themselves in small groups once the group MOOC was passed. Now we had another challenge, of course. If you're a teacher, you're going to grade your students. It's part of the policy. We need to do it even if it is a course which is situated in free space. So we needed to come up with evaluation instruments. We made three, a, a batch of three options. Well, not options. Three things we did to evaluate the student. First of all, we made the SAM scale. It's something used in Belgium. It's looking at skills and uh, what is it? attitudes. Oh, I couldn't come up with the English word. So attitudes and skills. And we would, the SAM scale has 10 elements, five on language, five on digital literacy. And that scale is used, uh, it, it's also explained to the students, and it's used during the course. So to make up a final grade. Then every course, which, takes, which is always two hours, at the end of the two hours, or just before it, they, each student gets five minutes to jot down their uh, logbooks and how the experience was, this course, what did they do, what did they like, what didn't they, didn't they like. And they could just share whatever they felt like. So it's up to them, but they need to fill in the logbook. Why? Well, it, has, it gives us some insight into the course, of course, from a student perspective, but it also makes it possible to write, to give us a clear account of how their English writing uh, pro progresses, or their French, depending on the... And they are, in the beginning, they were doing it uh, fairly neutral, let's say, but now they're really starting to make logs that point towards challenges or that give uh, more uh, insightful uh, information to the teacher. So it's really something very useful. At the same time, so we are now mid, at midpoint in the project, as we did a little look at how the teachers feel and how the students feel, because the teachers, let me, uh, I forgot to say it, say it previously, Three teachers, one man, two women, one 35 years old, 41 years old, and 53 years old. There's only one who likes technology. The other one is just, just wanted to, she can be persuaded to do anything which is new. <coughs> so that's, it's uh, like an enthusiastic teacher uh, for innovation, but not, that much for technology. And then there was one who wasn't really into it, but with the two hours she could, would get a full-time equivalent. I mean, who would pass that out? So, which made it a really nice, diverse teacher core to follow as well. Now, all three of them stayed passionate about, or became passionate about the course, but there were some challenges because it's difficult for them to let go. It's difficult to say to the students, now go out there, venture out there, and follow content which I don't understand. Because if a person would uh, choose Buddhism or would choose robot, uh, robotics to follow, a language teacher will have a hard time really understanding the content, or they need to go through the MOOCs themselves. And you can't go through all those MOOCs when, as a teacher. So. It was creepy for the, for the teachers to really let go, but it was feasible. Their first reaction might have been, the workload! But now they're settling down and it's becoming a little bit easier. Now, I want you to think up questions. 
I will move. Look, I have this lapel microphone. <coughs> I can move around. And if everybody stays silent after my presentation, I will just pick someone. <laughs> so be a good colleague, come up with a question, and then I won't have to just point someone out. I will. Ha <laughs> Now, the research behind it is also real, uh, well, I think strong research, but I'm very subjective. I came up with it. So pinpoint the failures in the research. Please do. It will make it stronger. Up to now, it's good. We developed uh, some instruments, so you said the sand scale, as we saw, but also an instrument which is... Uh, ah, this is the sand scale. Okay. Also an instrument that we use outside of class. Now, this is really something interesting to look at, I think, because it's based on self-regulated learning, and it looks specifically at self-esteem uh, and at motivation to give us like a parameter to see how they, the students are doing in terms of motivation, in terms of self-esteem as the course moves along. Because it is kind of most, sometimes people say MOOCs are okay, but it's very chaotic and I don't know, I don't dare to interact or I, it affects the personal, uh, the learner persona, let's say. So, as the course is uh, going along, we are, we are having nice results, but it's the end uh, curve that will make all the difference, whether it's a successful uh, course or not. All of the things we do are open, so you just download it and you can click and you can see lesson plans and you can see the self-regulated qu questionnaire because that's given at three points during the year and it's, so the questionnaire is given, and after the questionnaire, not the first time, but the second time uh, it was given, we had interviews with the students one-on-one, -on -one, so they wouldn't feel the peer pressure of giving information, and just to see how it felt. This course where they were in charge of everything they did. So it had a lot of, let's say, impact on students and teachers. And, but the impact, as one of the challenges was fitting it into the school policy, uh, the impact is slightly related to the school values. So they want to be an open school. It's a mixed school because it's a city school. And it wants to create some skills and competencies they can ta take along afterwards as well. So one of, in the questionnaire, we also look at whether they think it's useful for their la later life or not. And not just one question. We have, it's a 50 uh, question questionnaire just to double check the truth that they are uh, in the, their answers. And so we want them to grow. Of course, the school wants to have students with marvelous grades in university as well. Now, if you look at the, the classic lesson and the MOOC lesson, there is a clear <coughs> shift. I mean, it's the students taking control. And at first, of course, in the group MOOC, you have uh, strong support of the teacher. But once they move to the own MOOC, the support is just guidance. It's not really taking them along uh, by the hand. And so it's really learner, a shift towards more learner-led, and a real one. Because the simple fact is the teacher does not know the content. So the only thing they can do is give support, genetic support, which makes it really interesting. Inevitably, it increases some digital skills, at least uh, just to make a selection of the courses, just to do the courses, just to be able to follow online courses. But I think it also increases their uh, autonomy in learning. So they're getting or I, I still hope, they are getting more inspired to follow their own choices. We all know if we do something we really like, it goes quicker. And if we meet challenges in something we are trying to learn, even if, uh, if it's uh, growing tomatoes and it doesn't work the first year, but we really want our own grown tomatoes, we will do the extra effort. Always, if you're passionate about learning something, it's the same with them. Some of them couldn't wait to start with their own MOOC. Can we start now? We know. Come on, let's go. So 
there was compassion that the teachers could really feel, which is, I think, great. But there's more. If you look at MOOCs, because of the media that is available and because of the freedom on which you return to the material or not, you have an extra for students with learning difficulties as well. They can rewatch the media, they can uh, look at the videos at home if they want to, they can look at the transcript, they can like repeat it in the way that feels comfortable for them and not necessarily in a classroom setting. So whatever makes them feel good uh, can help. And of course it's also for the gifted students because they can just say, we will follow this course, CLIL MOOC, but in the meantime, I've already registered for something else and I'm following that one Whoa! with great enthusiasm. So it, it gives them incentives, not necessarily limited to the school. The impact at this point is really all uh, effective because uh, the teachers, as I said, become more motivated. They are also making a promotion in, with the other teachers just by talking about it. But of course, there is this workload. It's a new course. Each one of those teachers has had to put in extra work to get those two hours done. And not the extra work with where you prepare the course because you know it's two extra hours of, uh, let's say, uh, Kaiser in, the Latin, in history or something. No, it's really new to them. They didn't follow MOOCs before, so they need really need to rethink the complete approach. And there's also another challenge. In school, now we can put it in free space, but schools tend to change, and sometimes you have opportunities, and then it shifts, and the audience, you get another direction, and then... So it needed to be flexible, and, but it is. Up to, at this point in time, we say, okay, it's flexible enough, we can change certain things if we need to. So the role of the teacher is changing and everybody, it's kind of challenging to get teachers to shift their uh, attention, but just because of the course, they shift it without really thinking too much of it. They feel it, there is some anxiety, uh, but they get over it much, much quicker. And then of course, there, there's one challenge that just keeps, uh, hitting us in the face, let's say. That's on average, the MOOC learner is much older, is much more experienced. So they come into the MOOC forums and they use different jargon and they use different kind of look. Look, this is who I am. <laughs> Some people do that, and especially if they're uh, experts in a certain area. While students aren't always that uh, sure. Sometimes they are, because they're teenage optimists, so they just pff, barge in there and into the forums. But there is this slight discrepancy which is difficult to uh, overcome. It's a challenge. We, and luckily the teachers know how to handle it, but still, that's something we need to rethink about. Now, so, MIT project, where are we? If you look at the survey uh, that we did with the questionnaire, there is, but well, it doesn't say too much because we are at midpoint, but still there is an 11% increase of motivation and more students think, yes, I can use this later in life as well. So I'm already happy. Can we stop here with the research? This, but there is still half a year to go. Well, the teachers, they self-reported uh, in talks because it, I, it never came to mind to make it a double project. So to look at the students as well as the teachers. Now, I think I should have started with the teachers, with a kind of teacher nar narrative project for research as well. Because they clearly indicate that their digital skills have increased in, really increased, and they feel more confident with other technologies as well. So it really has a surplus without them really being asked to do this or do that. They just do it for the sake of their students, not for their own sake. And they are also getting to be more 
open to their students in a way that they trust them to do the right thing. They can see it happen in front of their eyes. Of course, you have a selection of students, but still there's more of a willingness to also become the guide and not be the, the, the classic you know, teachers. So there is a shift. And I think with this project, we, it's just like a tiny, brings it a tiny bit closer to passionate, successful learning. And I think it would be good to have more people involved, more countries, more schools involved, and really see whether it works on, in different settings as well. So, if you want to go for an international EU proposal on it, it's possible. Everyone who likes paperwork, please raise hand. Uh, it's no one? Ah, it's the same with me. I do. But still, we could make it happen, I'm sure. Now, the slides uh, can be... Uh, no, not that. Where is it? Slide share. Here, this one. So if you go to slide share and you say Ignacia, you can just download the slides, look at the instruments, and do whatever you like with it. Use it yourself or, or mail me and say, hey, there's something wrong. That is wrong. So now, I hope you have been thinking. I'm ready to answer questions, and if no questions come, I will take my finger and point at someone. I sharpen it. Yes? Ah, yes. Yes, yes, yes! Hands up. Get you to use this. Hi, that was fascinating, Ignatia. My name is Kate. I'm from Hello, GMIT. Um, if the students choose the MOOCs themselves and you don't have an insight into the content, how can you be sure that the standard is high enough hmm. if it's been used on a course that is accredited and needs to re achieve a certain level for the students to get a, a, a receive a, a, an award? Well, we had that discussion. And so we said, look, it doesn't, the MOOC itself doesn't need to be, uh, well, it's going, the chances that the MOOC on each of those uh, platforms will have high quality content is rather high because the cost of the MOOCs is rather high for the institutes. But we also said, look, they can follow even if it's not that high of a quality MOOC because it will teach them uh, a certain sel selection criteria. So the, all of the teachers said, okay, we're going in like that. They choose, if they say, look, We've learned enough, come on, we can choose them ourselves. Choose them and let them go about and they need to discuss it, so they use the language. They need to uh, analyze whether it's a good MOOC. There are really uh, in-classroom exercises for that. So the teacher can regulate if, if any regulation needs to take place. But in the meantime, they're learning. And next time, they will make sure that they look like one of, the, the, uh, one of the sessions is on selecting a course based on the introduction video. So they look at several uh, introduction videos and they need to say why they think the course will be good. And then they're taking to the syllabus and then they're taking to other criteria. So it is like if they go through the group MOOC and then they select a really, let's, uh, I'm looking for a nice negative word. <laughs> But uh, not so good MOOC. Yeah, substandard. It's their, yeah. yeah, substandard. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Uh, then it's their responsibility. So we okay. keep that option open. Okay. Um, just a second question then. If um, you had 40, 42 students, yeah. and I think you kind of hinted towards it that while a lot of them would be very motivated and would engage, what do you, how do you deal with then the ones that don't, that are maybe traditional learners who need their hand held and need that little bit more guidance? The teachers are standing by to pick up the, those students and to give them more of a uh, guidance. Now, if they, with making the small groups for the own MOOC, they also looked at there wouldn't be three traditional, let's, let's call them, uh, traditional students together in one group. 
because that would make it really hard for them to progress or to dare to progress or to uh, surmount their own um, anxiety, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination. And so we it's a team effort. Yeah. yeah. Even if the, in the own MOOC they are grouped uh, by three, so it's not a completely individual MOOC that they can follow. We hope that afterwards they will be able to follow an individual MOOC with the skills they have acquired, or if they want to, because, I mean, it's a new course, so there were a lot of students who really knew what they, not knew, but knew MOOCs, let's say, so who went to it because they wanted online learning and they wanted to interact with students from different nationalities. Mm -hmm. That's like a major motivation for them. But there is a, a support, there's still this support in class at every moment as well. Okay. And just very last question, I'm sure lots of other questions. <laughs> um, on assessment, yeah. how do you, um, in this case here, was it just about them experiencing MOOC? So you just mm. want to see, did they gain experience in that? I'm just trying to say, think from my point of view yeah. to translate that then for, I'd say, a technical subject, how you could go about assessing it if each one of them has, you know, kind of gone off on a different road. Yeah, definitely. We had uh, the benefit of not having to look at content too closely mm -hmm. because we, our focus was on uh, language, language use, in talking, discussion, writing and listening, all, all the factors, and on the digital literacy. So, um, which made those, the, like, let's say, degrading... Uh, it was much easier. Well, yeah, it, was it made this much easier. Yeah. Okay. But from an assessment, if you would use it to build a course that would allow them to get certified for, to go to the, uh, into university or something, then content, the content of the MOOC will come in and will need to be assessed. What is done with, with the teachers that uh, use MOOC material in their own curriculum for specific content, yes. they make their own assessments and on top of the MOOC assessments to make it okay. easier because otherwise they're just too complex for 16, 17 year old uh, secondary, mm -hmm. well, most of them. Okay, that's lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes. You know, blocks of six weeks and yeah. they're not totally open yes. to use when you want to use them. How do you get around that? We got around it, uh, for example, with the rise of the superheroes. We realized that would be a good MOOC, but it started in August. And so we said, okay, because it's a group MOOC, we don't need to really go in cohort learning mode at that stage. So the teacher just registered. And from the first uh, session onward, all the students were asked to register. Once you're registered, in most cases, the material stays open for a year. So that's how we fix that kind of a, it's a loop around, but nevertheless it works. And the same with the own MOOC, so they could, chose, they could choose between the MOOCs that were available from mid-December to mid-January as a starting point, because at that point we wanted them to experience cohort learning, with a, and also it was something they wanted to do as well. So there was a month time slot, and they needed to register, and then for the ones who would start in half, half December, their session on the own MOOC would start slightly earlier than the others. So there was, uh, at the teacher's discretion, they built in certain activities that could either be really the MOOC experience or additional material that they went through. So it was, in throughout all the lessons, you could see that there is a little bit of leniency always built in. So it's not really as strict as a normal, regular uh, course session would be. Okay, thank, you. thank you. We'll take one more question. Who had their hand up here? Hi, thanks for that. That was brilliant. Uh, my name is Orla and I teach um, I'm coming in a, closer. a very large um, lecture, a very large um, class. Yes. And I'm thinking for this semester, Sorry. it's kind of frightening already, but I'm going to have 140 bodies in front of me. Yes. And uh, you had three teachers with 42 students, which yep. is an average of 14 per head. Yeah. How can we make it huge to, to work with classes of the sizes we have to mm. deal with right now? 
and what's uh, and what is your approach? What would what would your approach be in terms of your lesson? Is it a blended learning? Up to what extent? Or? No, none no, so far. Okay. Well, except that I try, I've always tried to put um, links on the Moodle platform for them to um, suitable video clips yeah. and additional things. But I, f I don't know how much they use them because yeah. anything additional is, for some of them, as you say, heads down straight away. Yeah. You know, just tell me what I need to do. What do I need to do for this exam? Or yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's all I want to know. But um, So I do put the additional things up there, but I worry about um, using this as an adjunct, and I'd love to use more stuff, but that when it's additional or extra then you don't have like the time to spend in a lecture class discussing mm. it if it's mm. if it's optional it needs to be mm. to be optional but it's additional work on a workload that's quite huge for them yeah more so than for me yeah then it becomes more, because in this case we could always uh, the support was really heavy at the start because people well the students were needed to learn how to move through MOOCs, but with this own MOOC, they just kind of, well, they say, no, we're doing great, and they just talk to the teacher at uh, certain assessment points, like now you need to give a presentation, what did you see, or just the language uh, stuff. So, it's clear that with 140 students, if it's a steep learning curve at the beginning, it's going to be really hard to do so. But you might want to identify champions. There are always some students that are capable of doing more stuff and then just centralize the groups, the, the in-class groups around that. But definitely, because one teacher actually has 19 students and she wanted to only uh, have a group of 12 students maximum. But the, the direction kept saying, ah, oh, it's just this one kid. It will be a good kid to add to your group. And she, at a certain point, she said, look, it's 19 by 20. I'm just moving out. <coughs> so uh, I can see the pressure building up. But, oh. 